Good morning, everyone. Afternoon, evening, wherever you are when you're seeing this. Um, I'm Asha Swami, and we're continuing our sheltering in place. Morning conversations. <clears throat> Let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, Dear friend Swami Kriyananda, Humbly we bow to you all. Help us to understand your ways in this world. Give us the insight and the courage to accept with gratitude whatever you bring to us and bless all your children that we may feel your presence in our hearts and be uplifted in love and in joy. Om. Peace. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm, I've been working with the way of Ananda Sanghis, and I think I'm going to get, get to it today, but I was having a conversation earlier this morning with a friend, and he just highlighted something that, that is a, a real challenge for all of us. And I know when yesterday I was talking about the news of the day and the, the civil um, unrest, I, do, I, I, I distrust the media in terms of they will always exaggerate toward the negative. So I don't really know for sure what's going on around our country, but it's definite that on today, whatever it is, June 3rd, June 2nd, 2020, that things have not been normal in many places. And uh, you know, a friend of mine lives in New York City was sending me a snapshot of their, her office building being the windows being boarded up on the retail level downstairs. It's just like, these are, these are not normal times. So I was, I don't want to make it seem that it's easy to be calm when the world around you is becoming very unsettled. And especially because the world around may become more unsettled. And I, I, it's, it's like, we need to practice now before it gets much worse. I've for reasons of my own, which I think is just working out past karma. I, I pray it's not anticipating future karma, but it's definitely working out past karma. I've done a lot of reading in my life about people who end up in very difficult circumstances, whether it's living under an oppressive communist regime or a dictator or a, just a, or incarceration or discrimination. I mean, history is full of these kinds of incidences where People just like you and me. Our lives are just completely flipped over or made extremely challenging by um, outer circumstances. I was reading about uh, Nadia Comaneci, who was a very famous gold medalist gymnast in the Olympics, and she was from Romania. And they suffered under a brutal dictator in that country for a very long time. And she just described her life as fighting every month to get enough to eat. You know, it's just like, that's a picture that we, we in this country, I know, I don't want to be naive, there are people who struggle like that. But as a whole, that's not what our lives are like. It's very hard to just be casual and just say, oh, God is in charge. And, and so we don't, want our, we don't want our equanimity to be a facade. And we don't want to feel that we have to put on an attitude that we don't sincerely feel. Um, the image that I've often used in, in terms of spiritual growth is that an apple tree can grow from a seed. I've been thinking lately about the miracle of seeds, but that's something else. But an apple tree, there's so much life force inherent in there that given the right conditions, that seed will become an apple tree. But it doesn't become an apple tree by just flipping over and becoming an apple tree. There's so many stages of development that, that seed has to go through before it can become a fruit-bearing tree. And within us is the seed of perfect God realization. But we don't get to it just by reading some good ideas in the book 
and pacing them on and saying that's who we are. There's all these different stages that we have to go through before we have built the foundation, we have courageously confronted every delusion, and we have within ourselves, within ourselves truly transcended it. So that that it's just not a reality that we will be taken in by anymore. You know, we have our tastes change as we evolve. Swami Kriyananda talked about when he was in Switzerland as a child, when he went to school in Switzerland, there was a particular sweet that he just loved. He and the other boys just loved it. And so when he went back to Switzerland as a grown man, you know, 40 or 50 years later, he saw the sweet on the counter. And so he he bought some of it. And when he just tried to eat it a little, it was just appallingly sweet. I mean, it just had had no redeeming qualities as far as he could see. And he remembered that as a child, he would just devour them. But in the meantime, he'd been exposed to other options and his uh, whole being had changed as, as we do from children to adults. But that's exactly what we're doing when we're growing spiritually. We are maturing as devotees and each stage of maturation has its own realities. So where this... Um, has to do with is well let me just let me think about this what this has to do with is um anybody who has even oh i started to say i've i've studied a lot of uh studied is too big a word but i've read about i've read stories true stories about people how they survive in difficult circumstances and there are just somehow when evil gets in the ascendant it just gets in the ascendant and it happens that the balance shifts from uh, enlightened leadership to to nefarious leadership, from uh, from civil order to civil chaos, from uh, the rule of law to a, a disregard of the rule of law. And these are these are things that happen historically. We suffer nowadays because none of us study history, so we think everything that's happening is happening for the first time but it isn't, and there are patterns that we can see. There are patterns happening in our country that are deeply concerning, and there is no guarantee that the shadow forces won't win out over the light forces for a while. I talked about this yesterday, so I'm not going to go into it at great length because there's a different part of it I want to talk to. Earlier in these broadcasts, I did, I believe, two mornings on the caste system. And the caste system, although we think of it as a social a social situation in India, the, the, the caste system in its true understanding is four stages of the evolution of consciousness. And most of us uh, operate between the second and the third. And the second stage, which is called the Vaishya stage, and it's the merchant stage, but it doesn't matter what it's called, is where we, we, we keep needing to adjust our environment so that it doesn't make us uncomfortable or afraid. And, you know, this is where most political activism comes from. I mean, you know, what you're doing makes me sad. It, I, I, I suffer for the people that you're hurting. I need to make it different. So it's, it's, it can be a, an altruistic um, era of life. It's not that there's anything wrong with it. It's the seed becoming the apple tree. But the thought form is, I'll fix the environment and then all feel better. Or if the environment isn't fixed, I can never be at peace. So a lot of times people who are social activists spend a great deal of time being unhappy. There's a, a woman that I know who has a very, uh, she's an acquaintance, she's a, a distant acquaintance, but she has a very angry temperament. She's had trouble, a lot of trouble in her life because she's always mad at someone. <laughs> And so then she decided to be a social activist. So she took up causes where she can be mad at everybody, you know, causes like human trafficking in West Africa or something like that, just places where the problem is so deep and so difficult to solve that she can always be angry and and fixing and, and will stay angry until it's fixed. I mean, it's all just great if it were fixable. And you get someone, well, I'll go to that in a moment. But the problem is the hum human beings are not really the deciding force on the planet. And that's the, that's the line that, that is very, very difficult for people to cross over because 
it really, it's, the words are very simple. It's like either there is a benign, loving influence in charge of this planet, in charge of me, in charge of you, in charge of every good or evil person that we see, and that these cosmic forces are expressing themselves for a plan that's much bigger than the one we can see or may even experience in our lifetime, or that's not true. And the only way a person of compassion can find any peace in this world is by the deep realization that human beings are acting as instruments of a higher force, and that higher force is benign and loving and helpful and present for everyone. But that's a very, very, very big leap. And I'm saying that because I think that's what's being asked of us um, in this particular moment in time. It's, it's you know, everything, once, once bad things start happening, more bad things start happening because dissonant vibrations create more dissonance. I, I believe I read on one of these uh, in, uh, broadcasts, th- these words that Master had written about how one thing follows another because of the vibrations. In like World War Two was just World War One was just ending, and it was such a difficult period of time. And then, uh, am I saying World War One or World War Two? The Spanish influenza. I think it was World War One, but now I can't even remember. But it was the end of the World War, and you mean like, oh, gosh, an, enough suffering. And then this influenza goes around the globe and kills more people than were killed in the war. And I'm sure if you were living through that, it was just like, will this never stop? Mumbai is the is the center in India of the COVID outbreak, and a typhoon, you know, is is coming or has come to hit Mumbai. And here we are in the middle of this pandemic, and then all this police brutality it results now in people rioting in the streets. It's like, will this never end? And the question, the answer is maybe not. So we have, and I don't mean that, I just say that, like maybe not. We can't make our security based on, on, on wishful thinking. I know when this woman um, was mistreated profoundly by someone else, and she was struggling with a great deal of anger and many other issues, and she went to Swamiji and she said, well, I realize that there's no reason for me to be upset because everything happens exactly the way it should happen. And Swami said, no, those people behaved very badly. (laughs) And he said, you can't comfort yourself by telling yourself a lie. You can't say, oh, they all did the right thing. No, they didn't. They did something that was very unfortunate and you were severely hurt. But what you do after that, do I remain angry? Do I remain judgmental? Do I want to condemn them for it? Am I constantly agitated because the bad people exist in this world? So we have to be able to accept, to see clearly, to discern, to anticipate, and not be frightened. Is that an easy assignment? Oh, no. This is lifetimes of effort that we're working with here. So the Vaisha level of the spiritual path is that I work to make the environment better. But I work to make the environment better because as long as there's something out there that I don't like, I'm, I can't be at peace within myself. So we spend a lot of time just trying to move the pieces around and act as if, you know, human beings are in control. And after a long enough cycle of that, after a long enough cycle of starting revolutions and then watching the ideals be destroyed and, you know, starting great charity works and then watching some weird aberration come into it, whatever it might be. It's just light and dark, just in a continuous interplay. It's it's amazing how many um, wonderful lifetimes end in great difficulty. A- Amy Semple McPherson was this fabulous evangelical preacher, contemporary of masters in Los Angeles in the 20s and 30s, and she was fabulously successful. And, uh, literally thousands of people came to see her each week. And then... Either she was actually kidnapped or she ran off with a paramour. It's not really known which happened. But she was gone for a couple of weeks. They thought she had died in the desert. She reappeared and claimed she was kidnapped. And uh, and her reputation was destroyed. They just savaged her in the newspapers. Just It's just like 
It happened so often. Swami Kriyananda, he went through, through years of just terrible persecution. You can still find on the internet these, quote, very convincing stories about what a monster he was. It's just like, that's the way it works. How are we going to deal with this? You know, and this is, I, how am I going to deal with it? How are you going to deal with it? Well, from the vicious stage, when we gradually figure out that we can't control the world around us, we realize the only thing I can control is my inner consciousness. Now, at first, when people see <coughs> or even <coughs> feel themselves shifting from Vaishya to Kshatriya, you feel guilty. You feel like you're abandoning the cause. You feel like you're hardening your heart or something like that. And, and it's, it, that, that, that transition itself is a real struggle. And I've watched a lot of my very serious devotee friends when you sort of touch the area of uh, social upliftment and politics, they just revert back into this um, fiery liberal thing where the government needs to do this and the government needs to do that. And because it's, it's very hard to feel in good conscience that fixing the environment is not what we ought to be doing. But we gradually realize we crash and burn on it is what happens. And then we realize that that what really needs to be changed, at least first, is my inner consciousness. Because this whole world is vibrations. And if I'm trying to correct wrong with wrong energy, then all I'm doing is just creating another ping pong, another ping pong game. I'll push you back with my force, and then it'll be your turn, and you'll push back with your force, and then I'll push you back with my force, because the world just doesn't stay. But when we become a kshatriya, we realize that it's, it's, it's the vibrations of consciousness that are really what's happening in the world right now, always. And so if I begin to work on my conscience, consciousness, which is to say the battle moves from outside myself to inside myself, and right consciousness then comes into this question, are we part of a greater reality? Is that a benign, loving force that is active in this world, that is conscious? of what is going on here. In Autobiography of a Yogi, Master says, Babaji and Jesus are concerned about the conditions of this planet and have planned the salvation of the planet. That's, I mean, like, how do we verify that? You have to inver- verify it intuitively. But one is, always has to be working with, with oneself. If that's true, why am I worried? If that's true, why do I feel that I have to be so agitated about it? And if it isn't a strong enough held belief in me, either we just keep operating on the Vaisha level, or we try to figure out how to make that a reality for me. What do I need to do spiritually? What kind of inner exercises? What kind of um, self-introspection? I, I, I was recently making some decisions that... Um, that could have a financial impact on my life. I mean, it's not even, it's it's small. My world is too small to really be important that way. But I was just, you know, I was, I was just thinking, oh, I know more, more truly when the, when this epidemic started, I had this, uh, I had this deep desire to stuff the house with food. I had this real anxiety that I was going to run out of food. So I filled all the cabinets, you know, with 10 jars of peanut butter and lots of flour and beans and just everything like that. And it's been almost comical because everybody keeps bringing food into this house. (laughs) And it's not even, you know, that we need it or anything like that. It's Divine Mother saying, oh, you want food? Here's food, you know. You're worried about food? Here's food. It's just, it's like, do we believe it or do we not believe it? And that's an everyday thing. Why am I afraid? Why do I feel that I have to do this? Why do I feel so guilty? If I'm not out there trying to change the environment, you know, how can I cooperate with grace? And, and then I was thinking, I, I thought of him earlier, of course, of Mahatma Gandhi. Because Mahatma Gandhi, of course, is one of the most famous political activists of, of, of our times. He, he, trans, he stood up to the whole British Empire and liberated India from British rule. And he did it nonviolently. But the inner discipline that he expressed 
and that he demanded of those who followed him. So it was not, they were acting to shift the environment, but they were acting, they weren't acting as Vaishyas, they were acting as Kshatriyas, because their first responsibility was to change themselves. And then they presented that consciousness to their oppressors. And then we, we've heard stories, and there's a fabulous movie on Gandhi's life. I mean, these are, are well, this was 1948, so this was a long time ago for younger people who don't know about it. But the Gandhi's nonviolent uh, uh, followers, and there were many, many, many of them, there was a time when the British were, were, were using physical force to try to quell the protests. And the, the protesters just lined up unarmed. And when the first row was knocked over by weapons and, and uh, sticks, then the second row just walked up and presented itself to be beaten. And when that line was done, then the next line just walked up. And the power of that consciousness it's just the, the British couldn't stand up against it. They just couldn't stand up against it. Swami said, interestingly, uh, Master said, that it was because the British have a very strong sense of fair play. And he said, and they're essentially gentlemen. And they, they just couldn't bear that the odds were so stacked against the Indians. Whatever else they felt, it was, it was too dishonorable for them to treat people like that. Master said if it had been the Russians or other places, Gandhi would have just been assassinated and that would have been that. <laughs> so partly he was he was in the right place at the right time. But nonetheless, we saw an immense power there. And then when Martin Luther King took over and had to do what he was trying to do, I, I read quite a bit about his life. And one part I remember, it might have been crossing the bridge in Selma, Alabama, there was a point at which, it, I, I, I forgive me if I have the exact city wrong, but there was a point at which the police were on one end of a bridge and they were on the other. And, you know, the brutality at that time was pretty intense against them. But they had also, it was, it was the whole movement was based from the churches. And Martin Luther King was a minister and he would preach to them and he would preach to them about righteousness and godliness and, and put them into a state of relationship with God. And so that they were really, they were acting on behalf of God, but they were acting with the Kshatriya's consciousness because they had to master themselves before they could do it. It wasn't just trying to break you so I can have what I want. There were elements that wanted to do that, but that wasn't what Martin Luther King did. And so they had to come across this bridge and there was this is what I recall reading. At a certain point, he said, when, if when there's a direct confrontation, he said, fall down on your knees and begin to pray. And then later he said, we had to fall down on our knees to keep from running away. He said, because, you know, when, you're, when someone's coming at you and you know they're going to hurt you, the tendency is to run away. He said, but because we were on our knees, we couldn't run. I just, and you just think of the power of that. And that's not, that's self, that's self-sacrifice, self-discipline. And, and strangely, when you come into an attitude like that, you actually begin to experience that I am part of a greater reality and that there's a loving force with me, walking with me, guiding me. And that's, that's what our job is right now. It's not, you're not closing, we're not closing our hearts by any means. We're we're deciding what is really going to solve the problem. And, is, and there needs to be a police force, and, there, and, and bullies need to be stopped. Master, in his one world view for the future, he said, we have to have an international police force. He said, because there, were always, there will always be bullies, and bullies need to be stopped, whether they're leaders of countries or leaders of a looting gang. You know, we, it's not spiritual to stand by and let bullies have their day. But we have to do everything with this deep consciousness that we are just instruments of the divine. And I've said it many times, and this is also something that we have to, one has to really meditate deeply on this so that it's not just a platitude. This world is run by consciousness. This world is run by vibrations. 
And the work that we do as devotees, the, the, the work that we do on ourselves as devotees and the work we do to expand the light of what it means to live as we live in relationship to great masters with, with an inner spiritual practice. Actually, everything that I've been talking about in the way of Ananda Sanghis, all the different ways in which we become an instrument of that higher vibration is very serious work for the planet. It's very serious, extremely powerful service to the planet because it's all about consciousness. I saw this, just a a flash of a film clip of somebody who had looted a, a liquor store and then was apprehended by the police and they opened his backpack and he had a gun in his backpack. He was a, a big man and I, I saw the expression on his face. It was just heartbreaking, the man who was being arrested. Because you could see, oh my, you know, it was it, it, it hadn't worked out. He'd gone out for a, a wild night and now he was in the hands of the police and he was not going to get out of their hands for a long time. And like, what what moved him to do that in the first place? But this is the lesson that he needed. I was, I have a friend who's been incarcerated for many years, uh, falsely incarcerated, but nonetheless, there he is. The first time I went to visit him, he was in a, a local jail because he was having a trial, and it was just a very ordinary jail. It wasn't a like a full like the, the, a big prison, which is where he eventually went. And I'd never been inside a, a jail or a prison in my life, and. It was like a it was like a television show. I mean, just like it was stereotypical. There were there were these cells like this down this hallway, three or four cells like this, with the bars, just like you would see, and it was all sort of stone. And there were multiple people in most of those cells, and this wide corridor, and I had to walk down that wide corridor. It was a men's jail. I had to walk down that wide corridor to where he was taking me, where I was going to meet the man I was visiting. I remember I stood as close as I could to the center of the corridor. I just, you know, I just didn't know what was on either side of me. And I remember, because it's so boring there, when, you know, they came out, several of the men came out and they held onto the bars and they looked through the bars and just watched me like this. I didn't feel threatened by them or anything like that. I mean, it wasn't merely that the situation was safe. It was just, I didn't feel that they had anything against me, even though I was sort of staying to the center of the hall. But what I could feel was, they were they were chafing against the confinement, but I could also feel as soon as they got out, they would do it again. <laughs> because that's just who they were. That's just the impulse that they had at that point. And the only thing that's really going to make them law-abiding, better human beings, is to gradually raise consciousness. Because it was the consciousness that led to the action in, in the whole planet. You know, we have to raise consciousness. And as I was saying yesterday, this is a great time for raising consciousness. It's like, even though the people who have power, this is the Atlantean Roman story that it's on another broadcast, even though the visible power is in the hands of this darker end of the spectrum, the real power, and I mean this very deeply, the real power is in our hands because they are the past and we are the future. And I don't think it's going to be an easy transition. And I think all of us really need to take this very seriously. Am I part of a greater reality? Is there a benign loving force that is running this world? How can I become more in tune with that? How do I overcome my grief, my anxiety, my fear when I look around at this world? How do I master myself so that I can really be an instrument of the light. And this is a great sadhana. This is just absolutely the best sadhana. We're in a position, not yet, sitting in the Palo Alto community, not yet, it's not yet at our front door. Maybe it'll never be at our front door. But from here, from wherever we are, more powerfully we become a radiating force, it will touch people. They won't even know why, but it will touch them it will lift their consciousness just that little bit. And then, standing on the sidewalk, do I run in and loot that building? No, I think I won't. I mean, that's just that we're just moving it like that. But one by one, then gradually the whole energy shifts, which Master 
has promised us. I mean, this is our weird position. We're in an ascending age. Therefore, we have absolute cause for optimism. But we're in ascending age. Therefore, we can't withdraw from it. We have to participate. But we have to participate in a way that is God-appropriate rather than is just the habit of the mind. Not easy. Not easy at all. But uh, worth doing. And also, what choice do we have? God bless you.